I, I think uh, the number of participants is stabilizing, so maybe we'll get going. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Madhav Rajan. I'm the Dean of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and I'm also the George Schultz Professor of Accounting. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. It's, it's wonderful to see so many people uh, signing in for this, this event. I uh, wanted to welcome you to New Approaches in Philanthropy, which is the first session in the new Innovating for Social Equity event series hosted by the Rastandi Center for Social Sector Innovation. This has certainly been an eventful uh, year, certainly eventful last six months with uh, more eventful things to come, uh, starting with the global pandemic, the economic devastation caused by that, and the social unrest sparked by racial injustice the past six months, I would say, have laid bare the deep disparities that persist in this country. And these crises have moved segments of American society from, I would say, complacency to action, uh, but they've also raised questions about the progress that the social sector has or hasn't made towards a more just society. With so much money spent by public, private, and philanthropic sectors, one of the questions that's come up is, why do profound disparities continue to persist? This series, the Innovating for Social Equity series, will examine efforts across the philanthropic and private sectors to tackle the barriers to a society and economy that work for all. Tonight's conversation is going to examine how new approaches in philanthropy may be employed to identify innovative strategies for achieving social equity. Uh, we will ask questions such as, where has philanthropy succeeded in moving the needle on issues like racial equity and social justice? Why hasn't more progress been made? And is philanthropy part of the problem? So this session is gonna provide a rare opportunity for us to hear from uh, some of the foremost leaders in philanthropy in the US. So we have a powerhouse panel of speakers who together represent endowment and investment power of more than $14 billion. So I wanted to thank our moderator, Julia Stash, and our panelists, John Palfrey, Tom Tierney, and Lajun Montgomery Tabron. And of course, I'm very, very grateful to Chicago Booth Rastandi Center for putting together this excellent program. My thanks again to so many of you for spending your time with us and engaging with the school in this way. And there'll be time for live questions at the end of the panel conversation. Uh, so with that, it's my pleasure to hand the program off to our moderator, Julia Stash, who is the immediate past president of the John and Catherine MacArthur Foundation. Uh, she's the philanthropy executive in residence for the Rastandi Center for Social Sector Innovation. Please take it away, Julia. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to welcome my fellow panelists, John Lejeune and Tom Tierney. I'm going to point you to the Q&A section where their long bios are, but they are friends and colleagues. And each of them is a provocative thinker, but together, collectively, they really will bring to you this evening you know, incredibly varied expertise and experience. So let's just, let's dive in. Okay, for the basics, um, what is social equity? I think we all think we know, um, but what do the words mean? So I actually looked it up. I like the definition that I found from 1981, which was equal treatment to which all are entitled by virtue of being human. I like that, but the definition has gotten much more specific over time, talking about race and gender, economic status, sexual and gender identity, physical and mental disability, and more. But tonight, I think we're going to narrow and speak mostly about racial inequity. And when I think about that, two words actually come to mind, and those two words are baked in. So racial inequity is actually baked in from the very beginning of our history. And now, of course, we see that it is at the core of disparate treatment, lack of opportunity, limited life prospects in virtually every aspect of life. And by that, I mean from wealth to health, healthcare, jobs, education, housing, business, justice, and much more, which really means that virtually every institution, every policy, and every program is suspect. And it really deserves interrogation and change. Now, when you look back across history, Philanthropy has been a player, sometimes a large player, sometimes a small player, in every major move forward in American history. But let's not forget as well that with every major step forward, there's a pushback. 
there's a backlash that has actually limited truly enduring and truly transformative change. So tonight we're going to look at philanthropy and change. Now, of course, philanthropy cannot do anything totally alone and future sessions in this series, as the Dean said, will look at other actors, but there's no question about it. Philanthropy has the power and the responsibility to lead, but the question is, what will it take to meet this moment? So you've got the names of the panelists. Let's get to know them just a tiny bit. Let's kick off with a lightning round question to each of the panelists. So talk quickly about your personal journey. When you began your career, how were you thinking about social justice and economic equity, and how has your thinking changed? Let's start with you, John. Julie, thank you. It's a treat to be here and to be with these fellow panelists. And thank you to Dean Rajan and the, um, the entire team. Uh, my uh, journey is, I think, as, as many uh, born into privilege as a white man um, with a great interest in social equity, but certainly not um, a grounding in it through lived experience in any way. Uh, I began working at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency after college in 1994 and uh, was focused on a series of environmental justice issues, so ex aware of these um, topics in the field, but certainly um, have uh, had a ton to learn in the in the ensuing 25 or so years. And, and uh, that, I think, is true at MacArthur Foundation, too, as an institution today, um, but following some very important leads that you got started uh, during your tenure. Thank you. How about you, Tom? Well, thanks. And I'll uh, echo uh, John. Just pleased to be here. Um, I guess I'm a little bit of an odd duck in that, you know, my dad worked for a factory. I, I went to business school, went into business, and I wasn't thinking about social equity. I was thinking about business. I went to a company called Bain and & Company and loved that. But I had in the back of my mind that it, life wasn't a level playing field. And I started volunteering and volunteering, and long story short, I ended up leaving Bain to start a nonprofit with uh, three of us at the time that became Bridgespan over that of 20 years. It has been one awakening after another for me. And what I've learned is asking questions about other people's lives and about the barriers that really exist that maybe you haven't experienced helps you calibrate. And one quick illustration, you know, a few years ago, I wrote a book on philanthropy that when I reread it today, didn't understand racial barriers to capital, just didn't understand it. And I co-authored it with a fantastic, brilliant guy. Nevertheless, I would say over these last 10 years, especially as I've encountered more and more real life barriers that are racially oriented, it's been like a light going on in a dark room. Lejeune, how about you? Thank you, Julie. I'm also honored to be here with you all this evening. Um, so mine was very much a personal journey. Uh, I encountered social injustices in my own life. Uh, I'm number nine of 10 children. So I had uh, many older siblings who had been part of the civil rights movement and uh, they buffered me in some ways. So while I understood that injustices existed, I I didn't really start to encounter them personally until I entered college and, and left college and started my career. Uh, my father was also uh, in the automotive industry. He left Mississippi migrating north, as you've heard the story, and worked for Chrysler Corporation. Uh, but Tom, I think even though both of our parents were in the auto industry, um, my opportunities were, were, were not... Uh, certain for, for me, uh, nor was it for my siblings, but my father and parents believed in, in, in hard work and my orientation was always knowing that if you didn't work twice or three times as hard, you weren't going to be noticed. And so that was my entree into philanthropy, coming from a place of, of, of actually uh, participating in some of the programs that now the W.K. Kellogg Foundation funds uh, today, uh, but using that as a way of really strengthening my own uh, interconfidence and, and then beginning a passion to fight for all those other children like me. So many pathways, I think, to a place that is really important where we all find ourselves today. I just want to make sure that all four of us can be on the view at the same time because I want to have a little bit of a 
you know, interactive conversation. So let's move from the personal to what it seems like people today are demanding. People are demanding change that both recognizes and values leadership by people most affected by racial inequities. Change that shifts the power and change that sticks and change that doesn't have to be fought for again and again. So I wanna start with you, Tom. You are an observer and advisor to philanthropy. Why is the kind of change that people are demanding today hard for philanthropy? Is philanthropy's elite status, the inherent power dynamics, the networks, is all that part of the problem? Well, let me, uh, it's a great question. Let me define philanthropy because I think there are, there are two different categories. Uh, I'll call them professionals and there are two of them on the panel. Uh, organizations that are foundations with staffs, who actually have jobs to put money to work in service of society. Then there are individuals who are giving money away, sometimes with no staff, often with no staff, often as a part-time do-it-yourself. Um, they may be incredibly wealthy, but they're not thinking about this every day. For them, it is hard to sort out which is why you see a disproportionate amount of money going to, nothing wrong with this, major institutions that wealthy people are familiar with. We did work, and I won't linger on this long, but it's interesting about big bets. That is commitments of over $10 million. 80% of them in the United States went to major institutions, universities, hospitals, major arts. Why? Because well, people are familiar with them. They went to school there, they had the kids, whatever. whatever. Only 20% went to social change. That was despite when you went to folks' websites and if they were pledgers, letters they'd written, the vast majority said, we wanna help those in need. We wanna help make society better. We wanna give back, but it's hard to do. And we, if we have time, we can unpack what those barriers are. But for people that are only doing this, you know, a few hours a week, they're bombarded with requests and can't, figure it out, it's too easy to delay. It's too easy to say, I'll sort this out later. Or too easy to say, I'll give to my university. Uh, that's a good thing too, I forgot. Okay. Yes, yes. that's not a bad thing. And we can get into that more, but it, it, anyway, I'll set up. So uh, Lejeune, you know, working right there in leadership role in philanthropy, I wanna ask you, are there other problems too? I mean, I saw this when I was at MacArthur, this whole move towards strategic philanthropy with elaborate theories of change, the whole idea that you only do what works and there's way specific measurable outcomes. Has that gone too far? And is there bias built into all that that reinforces inequities? You have to be careful with uh, a, a full bait theory of change going into community if you really believe that the answer is within community. Um, I think what we've determined at the Kellogg Foundation is, you, you know, you should have um, an idea of what success looks like, but if you have it all identified and um, believe that the research is what's best for community, you're probably going to have some difficulty uh, connecting with the community members. At the Kellogg Foundation, you know, we talk about a theory of change, but it's very simple. And I think all you need is something very simple. Our founders said very clearly, uh, the way you make change in community is you uh, create cooperative planning. Uh, you infuse that cooperative planning with intelligent study knowledge that can be imparted by all of the members of the planning process and then together based on that process you take it to group action and that's when lasting change occurs because the people who actually aspire to for change actually create the change that happens and that is what sustainability looks like so i do think that if you uh overemphasize a rigorous process that doesn't include uh, agility and connection on the ground and learning from the people who have the problems, you're probably gonna miss it a lot of times. You may be successful, uh, but the real true sustainable su success will happen 
when you step back a little bit from that canned approach and you dig deep into community and, and learn from those who are leading the way uh, to make the change for themselves and their families and communities. You know, John, let's talk a little bit about when a foundation examines its own practices and realizes that it has been part of the problem. You know, MacArthur's been the largest funder of arts in Illinois. You looked at, at that and the foundation is making grants for decades. It was clear that MacArthur was exacerbating racial inequities. What do you see and what do you do about it? Well, Julie, thank you for um, teeing up the arts as a as a conversation point because I think it's a great example. Although, of course, the the pivot that occurred is uh, under your watch, not under mine. But um, MacArthur, for many many years, was an arts and culture funder. I think in a pretty classic way, and I don't mean to denigrate anybody, but I think there was a sense of you kind of threw the money out the seventeenth floor window toward the art institute or other wonderful institutions that do need the support and and are close by, um, and the uh, opera and the ballet and so forth. Um, but when you map that and looked at it, it was pretty clear that we were doing good, but within a very small geographic radius and largely to institutions led by white leaders and largely to institutions serving white communities. And those are good, wonderful, important institutions that do need support as well, much like Tom was saying with respect to large universities, but it wasn't supporting a truly equitable approach, nor was it really reaching everybody in the city by any stretch of the imagination. So the shift was to go from an arts and culture program to a culture equity in the arts program. And that flipped on its head the strategy and said, instead of having people who worked downtown in the loop of Chicago, that was going to be decided by people who lived out in the community in a broader sense. And the decision rights were gonna be shifted um, really dramatically to say, we will continue to give general operating support, which we believe in, We'll continue to do that on a steady basis so organizations can plan, but the decisions of who's going to get it and what amount and so forth is going to be given to the community to determine. And we're going to put a very high thumb on the scale, strong thumb on the scale in favor of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's not to say that a white serving institution can't get the money. Um, and of course, some continue to, but that we want a different heat map when we look at this again in terms of who's uh, serving. We want a different demographic setup of who's leading those organizations and absolutely every one of those institutions in our portfolio have to have equity at the core of what they're doing. So it's a work in progress. We're only uh, one, one round in, um, but uh, I'm totally confident we'll continue in this direction and there's a lot to learn. But it really, I mean, Lejeune, your founder was prescient. You know, however many, was that 90 years ago when, when he said that? That's a pretty amazing um, view of philanthropy for back then. And it's very, very much like what uh, the Culture, Equity, and the Arts program is doing now in Chicago. But I think the interesting thing about what you just talked about, John, is the willingness of philanthropy to interrogate its own practices. And Tom, this could even be something that individual, you know, ultra high net worth individuals might have to do, which is interrogate their own worldview to see if there isn't something in their own, the way they act, or maybe in the way they run their business that has actually uh, adding to the problem that doesn't just get fixed by being by giving money to another problem. But this acknowledging of where philanthropy has contributed and now taking responsibility to do things in a different way, it's a good bridge to talking about other ways to tackle the barriers and to use all of philanthropy's power to change society and the economy for the better. Now, of course, everybody thinks that philanthropy is huge and resources are big and they're growing. And you know, almost every day in the past three or four months, you hear of someone else who's making a $100 million commitment or a $50 million commitment or half of their, uh, half of their donor advised fund or something because they are motivated by the moment. But even with all that, I think we can agree that the scale and the complexity of the problems really dwarfs these available funds. So, but Tom, you and I met around the issue of bridge span, trying to bring money off the sidelines. Tell us about your, even a little bit more about your seminal research, but some of the innovative ways now that philanthropists have come together to make these big bets. Uh, but a, a little question there, does this working at scale, is there, is there something implicit in that that makes racial equity hard? So talk a little bit about you know, build on your earlier comments and. Oh gosh, okay, let me see if I can, I can do this uh, uh, quickly. First of all, start with the thesis that there in fact 
are, and I'm going to focus on high net worth folks who want to put capital work in service of inequities. Let's take that as, a, and you know, it's not 100 out of 100, but there's a segment out there that really wants to do that. They do not want to go hire 50 people to create a staff to get them to do it. So, okay, so what do you do? People are working hard, they're busy, you know, they're, maybe they're in their 60s or 70s. It's not like they want to spend full time every week doing this. So what do you do? So we started experimenting two years ago and we noticed that this is just a fact and it's kind of an appalling fact, but it's a fact. Um, the top 2000 households in the United States at least 24 months ago had around 4 trillion and change in assets. That's 2000 households. With median age around 65, baby boom generation. They were giving away as a percentage of those assets around 1.2% a year, 1.2%. Your assets have been appreciating, you know, six, seven, eight percent for 30 years. So do the math. They're getting richer. And that's despite pleasures. This is true of everybody, even people that said, I want to give more money away. So we said, gosh, there some of those people really want to give more money away. What can be done to create new models that doesn't that doesn't require hiring 50 people? And so lever for change with MacArthur was at creating a mechanism that would allow an individual donor, a couple, to create a competition and fund one or more organizations for tens of millions of dollars. Uh, Audacious, which is a collaboration with TED, same kind of model in the, in the sense that donors can come together and fund multiple projects. And I think so far more than a billion dollars have flown to many uh, racially oriented organizations around the globe through Audacious or a Blue Meridian, which is an aggregation fund. Think of it as kind of a private equity fund. So these are exciting new models that actually help unlock enable capital flow. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is it's still only about this big. It's a rounding error compared to the amount of capital that's out there. And so I'm, I struggle with how to unlock more capital to really address racial inequities and especially going to organizations led by people who come from the communities they're serving. We touched on this before, I can come back to it, but I just, that, that is, a, that is a, like a double barrier that these intermediary platforms are solving in a modest way, but not at a scale way, not yet. So I wonder if actually any of you could comment on the notion that if philanthropy is looking to deploy ever larger uh, amounts of money, are we running up against a, a field of leaders who by other racial dynamics have been held back from growing organizations to the scale that the, you know, that $100 million could be useful. I mean, we have a lot of work to do uh, to be helpful, uh, to take away the barriers to growth for organizations led particularly by people of color. Lejeune, do you have thoughts about that? I do. I, um, I, I want to just share a little bit about how we think about this at the Kellogg Foundation. First of all, um, when we leaned heavily into this work, which was around the 80s, we decided that the only way we were going to lean into it and, and think about it and get it right was to become a, an anti-racist organization and actually live the experience within our organization. And so we went on a, an effort to diversify our staff fully, diversify the leadership. Uh, our board is now 60% people of color. Our organization is 45% people of color. And our environment is one that embraces one humanity. Everything we fund, we do. So looking at that, we then went to our portfolio and we said, yes, we give away 5%, but we also have this 95% portfolio and determined that we could make that 95% work just as hard as our grant making efforts. And so we looked at our portfolio and began to think about the financial services sector and how that sector was less than 1% women and people of color. Uh, trillions of dollars, but yet less than 1% people of color and women. And so we took several approaches. We first set up a mission-driven investing portfolio where we said we wanted only emerging managers of color uh, and women 
uh, to be a part of that portfolio. And we set up structures to find those um, managers and to invest in them. We then said that we wanted to even do more than that because that was uh, only a small part of our portfolio. So we started creating um, partnering and creating funds of color where the people who could no who had trouble accessing the capital markets would have special funds where they could access those funds as people of color and receive support and uh, guarantees and other ways of accessing capital that they had been blocked from in the past. And then most recently, what we also uh, endeavored to do was to think about the entire financial services sector and say, if we had to change from within, they should change from within. So we've launched an effort called Expanding Equity, where we're working with some of the largest money managers there and asking them to look at racial equity from their own internal organization, as well as in how they invest their resources. And many have joined us and they're starting to look at their own hiring practices and their own biases within the organization and how they can reach out and be a, an ally with us on improving racial equality in their sector and throughout the nation. So we're constantly focusing on this issue and looking at every way we can, not only with our money, but with our leverage, with our influence and with our leadership to make systemic changes across uh, the nation and the world. Well, not only those three characteristics, but your buying power for- Absolutely. So there'll be some conditions for someone who wants to be an invest investment manager in your portfolio. Absolutely. But John, uh, Lejeune mentions the 5%. Um, you know, this has been a perennial conversation within philanthropy, which is why do foundations actually want to hoard or preserve their, what they call their purchasing power over time? This keeps, just like Tom was talking about money on the sidelines with ultra high net worth individuals, this keeps institutional philanthropy money on the sidelines. Uh, in spite of right now, incredible calls to increase spending to help number one, the nonprofit sector survive, to address the pandemic, generated economic uh, devastation, and now to ensure greater equity. How, how are you just generally thinking about the 5%, but also tell us a little bit about, you know, foundations issuing bonds. I mean, that's a new thing too, so tell us. Sure, I'll come back around to the bonds, but maybe just kind of restating a rationale, which is that, you know, I think that, the, that no one of us on this call and probably out of the 293 participants on the webinar would think that there isn't great need right now. In fact, maybe unprecedented need in our lifetime. Um, if we take the racial um, inequity topic, there's such a simple fact in Chicago. I was um, struck by the fact that in, uh, in June of 19, uh, a year before George Floyd was murdered by police, um, there was the re uh, report that came out saying that in Streeterville, if you were a baby born um, uh, on a certain day, that you had a 30-year lifespan expectancy uh, advantage over somebody born in Englewood. And if you think about the Booth School, I think you have an office in each of those places, right? The Gleacher Center in Englewood, and you've got um, your, your home base uh, closer to um, Englewood. So the fact that that's the situation in America right now and, and worst anywhere is in Chicago um, and then pile on COVID and so forth, there's real need. And, and on this racial inequity front, uh, we have to do something. So um, to say that knowing this and being focused on these issues, that we are simply going to do what we've done always in the same way, strikes me as a bankrupt way to think about it. And I actually think it's, a, it's an interesting um, phenomenon that philanthropy has decided that we're going to follow what in what universities or uh, schools or others that have endowments are going to do, which is simply to take 5% every year. The IRS tells us to do that. We'll spend that amount. And when things go well and the, the, the times are best and the stock market is highest, we'll spend a little bit more because that's 5% of that. And when it goes badly, like it did last March, we're going to spend less. So I actually think we need a different approach to thinking about our spending rates. And of course, the rule of 5% is a minimum by the IRS, so we can spend more. And um, under the budget that uh, you handed to me a few years ago, we were actually going to spend about 7.8%, as it turned out, as of March. So we were already spending uh, you know, more than the 5%. But when we met in March of, of last year, we decided um, that we want to do something different. And so along with Lejeune, along with uh, the Ford Foundation, along with uh, several others, so a group of five, we decided that we were all going to 
government commits to giving out billions of dollars more together than we uh, had before and that our spending plan would allow for. And the approach that MacArthur has taken, I'll let Lejeune talk about her own um, funding plan for it, but we decided along with a couple others to raise bonds. So uh, to the point Lejeune made about balance sheets, we figured we could, we were of course using the proceeds from the endowment, but we could use the endowment itself to be able to borrow money at a very low rate. Um, so it turns out that we were able to borrow $125 million at a 1.299% interest rate, which is very cheap. Uh, and then to give that money away, which we are doing, and with a focus on the twin pandemics of racial inequity and COVID with a hope to bring about a more inclusive recovery. So there's the immediate thing, how we do that and how we are accountable to the communities we are seeking to serve and so forth. But there's also the structural question is, can we, should we have a different formula at the at foundations to think about the way in which we spend more when there's greater need and you know maybe even you spend a little bit less when things are really going well in order to set aside money for the worst days. But that's a, a conversation to be had in future for sure. Let me, a quick question for Tom. In your conversations with ultra high net worth individuals, how much are they taken by the moment here? What is the challenge to them for their thinking about their responsibility or their commitment to this moment of racial reckoning? Um, well, first of all, I'm probably getting skewed data <laughs> since I'm talking to people that are leaning in philanthropically and you know, are oriented toward these themes. Um, but there's a big appetite and uh, I think there's huge untapped potential. If we can figure out, we, the big we, how to enable more capital to flow. And I'll give you one illustration where, since this is to some extent a business audience, uh, where I think business has done a disservice. And I was part of this. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, there's been a migration of business concepts into philanthropy. And one of those was, you know, philanthropy as an investment. Well, you know, guess what? You giving it away, Yogi Berra said, when you give it away, you don't have it anymore. It's not an investment like earning a return. It's charitable contribution. But that idea of it being an investment has led people to move away from unrestricted capacity building money. So don't fund an organization that needs to buy a computer system, needs to hire a chief operator. Fund specific programs. Don't fund their quote overhead. That idea disadvantages smaller nonprofits, community-based nonprofits, because they don't have the capacity to measure things. They can't put together brilliant PowerPoints. They don't have all that stuff. So it's kind of, you know, because you want better results, you force people to, to think and act in ways that, that they actually don't have the capacity to do. So back to your question. If philanthropists said, okay, I'm going to broaden my sourcing to what John was saying. I'm not going to go, it's not the same folks, it's not the same networks. I'm going to access broader sourcing. And then you know what? I'm going to not measure stuff. I'm going to judge. And if I find organizations that I think have leaders that are, I'm just going to fund them. I'm going to fund the organization. Unrestricted money. These organizations need unrestricted funds to build their capacity so they can absorb more money years from now. And they're starving. They're just starving. And big institutions aren't starving. They have development staffs. They're not, they're gonna, but anyway, so I think there is, there's a way to take advantage at this, uh, I hope it's not a moment in time, I hope it's a new era, to create new role models for people who are willing to move outside their philanthropic comfort zone and do things in ways maybe they haven't done before, but the society really needs. So one thing I want to, one of the things that I have always uh, associated with Kellogg and with Lejeune was your efforts, you know, which were launched in 2016, uh, focused on truth and racial healing and transformation. You know, I have to say, when you did that in 2016, I was skeptical. I said, who is demanding this now? And so I wonder if you were actually prescient and that this is an innovation whose time has come in this country. So how do you think about that at this moment in time? 
Yeah, I mean, talk about getting out of your comfort zone. I think we've been out of our comfort zone at the Kellogg Foundation for at least the three decades that I've been there. Uh, and particularly when it related to some of our work around racial equity and racial healing. Uh, when we launched our truth racial healing and transformation effort in 2016, I got many calls from people asking me, why are we funding the soft stuff? Uh, talk about general operating support. Nobody would ever fund healing. Uh, and uh, I had many conversations about that, but actually now that we're looking at this moment, what you see is healing is the most hardest work you can do and it's risky to fund because you don't know if it's going to happen or not. We've seen centuries where it hasn't happened yet, but we took that risk because we knew that in order for racial equity to materialize, we first had to heal the wounds of racism. And that's what our truth racial healing and transformation work is all about. And we invested um, $25 million in 2016 on top of $75 million a few years before on healing. And that's about building relationships, bringing people together, allowing them to face the truths of racism in their communities and nationwide wide and globally, but then taking that and turning that into productive, transformative conversation that gets at the root of issues. And, you know, I agree with Tom that many times philanthropy funds the symptoms, you know, what is manifesting that we need to fix. But we decided we wanted to fund some of the root cause issues, the root causes that when you're separated and you never get to be with someone who's very, very different, uh, how does that impact your ability to come together, build relationships, and grow communities? So our TRHT, Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation work is now um, going strong uh, and prescient, maybe, yes, and needed definitely, and uh, will need to scale and grow in the future. And that's why we uh, decided to increase our payout, because we see uh, a will now in our nation to address some of these root cause issues and to face some of our uh, long historic uh, systems and structures that don't serve all. And we want to be there and be a partner in this time and increase our payout in order to see if we can be a part of the solution in that regard. Now, what I'm hearing from the three of you is in the aggregate, actually sort of a mandate for philanthropy, which is acknowledge past contribution, be a partner in the healing that will change the, you know, the interpersonal intergroup dynamics, but, but go to the core of practices that have made it hard for people to see the value in uh, organizations and leaders that have eluded them in the past and who have suffered from disproportionate investment. I mean, I see the, uh, you know, just don't take the payout as a, you know, as a floor. Think about it differently. Uh, challenge even high net worth individuals to, to meet the moment here. Uh, none of them thinks about 5%. And so why do we have to, uh, you know, presume that that's the, uh, that's the contours of philanthropy. Streamline our procedures. Don't make them onerous. Uh, don't, don't go out for site visits and, re you know, reports that make philanthropic staff feel good, but are burdensome on organizations. I, there's so much that philanthropy can do to meet the moment, but, you know, time doesn't even permit us to talk about, you know, what some other foundations are doing, shifting to a singular focus on racial equity and justice, new large scale racial justice programs. Like Lejeune is talking, a racial justice lens on all decisions, inside and externally facing, larger general operating grants that have the money for growth and that can be used in the, you know, in the way that makes sense for the organization. Then I think also, openness that so many foundations are trying to do, being really open to the wise counsel from people and organizations that are closest uh, to these issues. So as 
In a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn Grossman, who's the executive director of the Rastandi Center. But I just want to say, in closing for this portion of the uh, evening, the stakes are really high for this moment. You know, anti-Black racism continues to shape American society, and it's playing out in enormous loss of human potential that the country needs, e loss of life, and diminished quality of life, intergroup and interpersonal conflict, and really one of the saddest components of it, hopelessness, which actually makes the case for some of the things we've been talking about, sustained leadership and innovation, but also the thing that's gonna make the difference over time, persistence in the quest for social equity that's based on moral, economic, political, and legal grounds. So let me turn it over uh, to Carolyn, who's going to take a look at questions and um, to each of the panel members. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a terrific conversation thus far, and we don't have nearly enough time to tackle all of the fantastic questions that have come in. But we'll start with a theme that's been raised around the nature of systemic change. So I'm going to combine two questions in one. One is really the general question asking, is the problem more basic? The structure of philanthropy provides a benefit to the donor without public accountability or without, with, with any of the right of the people to control how those assets are used. So that's the overarching question. And then uh, someone goes even deeper and Rich Hoop says, is not part of the problem just structural in that philanthropic capital continues to be more concentrated and to move significant amounts is very difficult. For instance, most CBOs in underserved communities are small grassroots organizations. 65% of nonprofits have budgets under a million, yet the capital flows to the large organizations. So how do you grapple with those systemic questions? I, I'd like to start, uh, and we do grapple with those questions, but I, I want to share how we've done it at the Kellogg Foundation, because I, I think uh, we understand that, yes, we're a large foundation, but we can also be a small foundation and meet those smaller CBOs where they are. So we've identified priority places is what we call them, and it's states, Mississippi, Michigan, New Mexico, uh, and then New Orleans as a city, and Haiti, and Mexico. Um, and we've named them our priority places. And what that means is we're going to fund in those places for at least a generation. Uh, and it's not just one grant. It's a comprehensive look at community change and systems change in these places and fund the efforts of the people and the will and the aspirations of those communities. So we figured out a way to break down our resources into doses that are appropriate for the communities and those institutions large and small within those communities so that over time, because they trust us, they know we're not going anywhere. We're gonna be there right alongside for a generation, changing and making these systemic, uh, comprehensive investments over time. So I think there are innovative ways. We don't, just because we have a large investment portfolio, um, we don't have to limit ourselves. Uh, I think creativity and innovation has entered into philanthropy and you see it in many different ways. Great, thank you. I may have waited on that. I, I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question exactly, but with individual philanthropists, there's kind of a different dilemma. Uh, the pattern for the last hundred years has been, you know, people make money, they give away a little bit of it at the end of their lives, and then when they pass on, it goes to the government, it goes to kids, and it goes possibly into a foundation set up in perpetuity. And there's a lot of analysis around this quote, wealth transfer of the wealth that's out there. That's what is likely to happen, which means to the extent there is philanthropy out there, it's gonna start flowing in 20 years and it's gonna pay a nickel on a dollar for the following 100 years. The, the interesting question is how do you get some of that money to be more giving while living? This last week, Chuck Feeney of Duty Free Stores and Atlantic Philanthropies 
was broke. He gave away his last dollar, something like eight or $10 billion. Amazing. But there aren't too many Chuck Feenies. So here, the philanthropic question is, how do you get people to step forward when it's pretty easy to, I'm doing, to do enough and just wait till later on and let other people you know, give the money away or what have you. So it's a different issue to motivate people to do something they don't otherwise have to do. So I think one of the things that people are getting at with some of the questions around systemic change is, is really the theme of this panel to begin with, not just relevant, not just about race and social equity, but about poverty. So a question came in and said, this year the Economic Innovation Group published a study, The Persistence of Neighborhood, neighborhood Poverty, showing that the turnaround of communities in poverty in US cities has been very rare. This harkens to the point earlier on about someone born in Streeterville, someone born in Englewood. Have you seen or been part of successful community turnarounds from poverty? And what do you see as key actions that made that possible? And how can philanthropy be channeled to these activities? Somebody want to take a, a stab at that? I mean, I know both um, uh, Lejeune and John are working in foundations that are have some aspect of the work is very place based. Yeah. And, you know, what I would say is, um, you know, when we look at COVID and the impact of COVID and you see the disparities uh, very clearly, uh, these disparities didn't just uh, materialize by happenstance. Uh, the disparities exist because the structures and the systems created those disparities. Uh, they were created to, to advantage some and disadvantage others. And so when you think about community change, uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's interesting to say that communities have to change themselves when no one's interested in changing the systems that created those uh, communities in poverty. Uh, and so those real, again, root cause questions about unequal uh, investment in education from all the way to the very early stages of a child's ability to be educated. And that structure exists. It's based on a, a, a property uh, wealth uh, formula. And if you're in an impoverished community and you don't have the, the wealth of that formula, how are you gonna get the best quality education? And yet then those communities are blamed for their inability to succeed. Uh, and so again, I think the answer is not just how our community is gonna change, is how is, are we gonna change as a nation and look at some of these structural systems that we've put in place and decide that we want to open them up and give opportunities for everyone. And I think as we take that journey, we'll see some change in, in people's ability to care for themselves, to access resources, to start their own small businesses where today they can't. And even those that they've started, we've now seen them uh, flounder during COVID. So we have some systemic in in inequalities that if we don't own up to it through the truth of our knowledge of our history, uh, we are gonna sit back and judge or we're gonna understand these systems and we'll go to work trying to fix some of them. I would certainly oh. vote, vote for Lejeune, but um, Caroline, would you like me to answer or would you like to move to another one? Well, I'd like to move to a, the, the next piece of this, which is another question that says, can philanthropy do anything at scale, really? Is there an example of a philanthropic effort that's been socially transformative at scale in the past 30, 30 years? And is that even the, now I'm adding, is that the purpose of philanthropy? I, you know, I think that there are, many, many ways in which philanthropy has helped in society. And there are lots of easy, easy critiques of philanthropy that one can level. So both of those are true. Philanthropy has done good and philanthropy has done harm. That is true today. That's been true for a long time. And I think you could look at 
the uh, funding that has been going on in the city of Chicago, um, funded by MacArthur and lots of other people. And you could say, you know, we are no better off than we were 50 years ago, 100 years ago from a racial equity perspective. I think that's fairly straightforward. That may be true in Abuja and Nigeria where we fund or in Delhi and India or in Mexico City and Mexico. Now, does that mean that philanthropy should just give up? I don't think that's the answer for a variety of reasons. One is, you know, ditto Lejeune. She's doing all these amazing things and we're right there with her, root striking along with and funding the truth, racial hearing and transformation uh, in Chicago uh, along her theory. Um, but I also think it's very important to note that there are a bunch of ways to, to see success, even in the, in the macro sense, not the micro sense of a project, which is philanthropy might take something that's going okay and make it way, way better. That would be the transformation scenario. I think that has not been generally the case in community-based um, philanthropy. You could take something that's going a little downhill and keep it flat. That would be a success, right? We don't usually celebrate that, but it might be a success. Or something could be going really far downhill and you make it a little less far downhill um, and, and help some people along Along the way. And I suspect that in those latter categories, there is more to be said for philanthropy. So I would take one particular example that a number of our foundations have helped um, to fund, um, which are CDFIs. So these are community development finance institutions that are having a bit of a moment right now. These are community oriented organizations that, um, and Julie and others um, at MacArthur um, helped to fund these starting decades ago. Um, and they have put a lot of people in houses. They have put a lot of money uh, into the hands of people of color who are on entrepreneurs and communities and so forth. And they have shifted from the kind of standard Wall Street based pure capitalist unfettered Milton Friedman style approach to um, uh, an economic uh, recovery or, or economic opportunity to one that actually is more community based. So I would say you could look at a bunch of housing units that exist that wouldn't have existed but for um, these investments. And those are positive things in terms of people's lives. So I think it does, uh, it matters um, what your frame of reference is. And I think we are continuing continually learning and, and hopefully from a position of humility um, that there's more we can do. Great. Well, I'm going to end with one last question uh, from a student from one of our Neubauer Civic Scholars who, uh, he, who asks, is it ever the vision of philanthropy to work itself out of a job? How does philanthropy play a role in supporting a world where corporations are paying living wages, by investing in corporations that internalize the costs of environmental destruction, by supporting a public sector, by supporting a world where ultra high net worth individuals do not own a majority of the world's wealth. So it's always, I, I always say it's the students who ask the toughest questions. So wanted to conclude with that one. I love that question. Uh, I've actually, stated that question. Uh, I would love it if uh, there was no longer a need to push uh, in the issues of equality and racial equity because the, it existed. Uh, I would gladly sit down and stop talking about all of these inequities. So, you know, that's right. And, and the only way, I guess, in this day, today, what I would say to that student and for all of us is, uh, we have to do our civic duty. We have to participate in the civic process and be a part. And anyone who's sitting on the sidelines complicit and thinking that somebody else's job uh, it is to fix all this, uh, that's an attitude that won't make the change that we need. We need every citizen of this nation to vote and to participate. And I think with that kind of engagement, we can see better days. Well, thank you. I know everyone could opine on this, but I do want to make sure we conclude on time. So I will let you have the last word, Lejeune. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks to all of you, to Julia, John, Lejeune, and Thomas for such a meaningful discussion. I hope that today's event has equipped you with some tangible takeaways and has sparked some new ideas. Before leaving today, I want to share some information on upcoming ways for you to get involved in social impact at Booth. All of the events I'm about to mention are listed on the events page at the Rastandi Center's website. So you don't need to frantically write everything down right now. So the next event is our Innovating for Social Equity, How Private Market Investors Affect Change on Thursday, October 29th, a month from today. And if you enjoyed today's event, we invite you to join us for the next one. We'll be examining how private market investors and entrepreneurs may utilize innovative strategies to bring about meaningful change. 
This will be moderated by Priya Parrish, Booth alum, a managing partner of private equity at Impact Engine and an adjunct assistant professor here at Booth. And the panelists will include Rob Gertner on Booth's faculty, Brittany Henry and Micah Sem. Student group Booth Social Impact is holding an event this Saturday afternoon. I will be moderating that. It's the kickoff for, uh, that the student group is holding for their group philanthropy initiative. And this event will feature a panel discussion on the problems uh, that our city is facing. It really, for those students in the group who are focused on place-based innovation and the needs of Chicago, this should be a terrific event. Panelists include Jim Castleberry, Xavier Ramey, and Jane Kimondo. Coming up on October 20th, the Chicago Booth Distinguished Speaker Series uh, will bring Darren Walker to our virtual campus. Uh, he, Darren Walker is the president of the Ford Foundation. So for those interested in continuing the discussion on the role of philanthropy in change today, this should be a fantastic event. We're excited to partner uh, with, with Booth for it, and uh, it'll be a fireside chat with Chicago Booth Dean Rajan. I also wanna draw something else to your attention. I, I gave our last question to a student, uh, and that student is one of the Neubauer Civic Scholars. The Civic Scholars program uh, has applications open right now. So for those of you who are on this call who are students and who have colleagues who work in the social sector, or for those of you who are alumni or leaders in the social sector who may know students interested in an MBA, um, please think about the Civic Scholars Program. For any emerging nonprofit or government leader dedicated to a career in social impact, please encourage them to apply to Civic Scholars which offers tuition awards up to 100% to MBA students who work in a designated 501c3 uh, or for the government. And you can nominate an emerging leader at the link on this slide. If you're interested in learning more about the work of Bridgespan, the MacArthur Foundation, or the Kellogg Foundation, we encourage you to visit their websites and follow them on social media. It would be a great way to stay connected with these organizations. Lastly, we'd love to get your feedback on today's event. We put together a short survey. When you exit the webinar, you'll see a pop-up in your browser with the survey link. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a few minutes. It'll be very short um, and we appreciate it. Thank you. And on behalf of the Rastandi, Se Rastandi Center for Social Sector Innovation at Chicago Booth, we hope to connect with you soon.